Thank you and welcome for coming. Uh, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Gurian and I am from Norwich University, not Norwich. So if you're expecting an English person, apologies from the offset. It's good to set expectations. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. Please do make sure that your phones are silenced. There are no scheduled fire alarms for today. Um, we are broadcasting to an online audience, so I'd like to say um, hello and welcome to everyone joining us virtually. Delighted to have you join our presentation. And then there will be some time at the end for Q&A, including the Zoom audience. I've been told um, there will be assistance monitoring the online chat. So if you do have a question from the virtual world, do feel free to submit those questions. And then I think we'll just go ahead and get started. So by way of background, as I mentioned, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Gurian. Um, I was trained as a scientist, actually got my undergraduate degree in human physiology from the Boston, um, from Boston University, then um, took an abrupt shift, um, realized that I love medicine, but criminal justice and criminology was uh, quite fascinating. No one in my family really does what I do, so it was a, a strong departure. Thankfully, um, Northeastern University was down the street. I was working at Children's Hospital was able to do my master's degree at night and complete um, a case study on Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo, two Canadian serial killers um, of some renown. Followed that um, here, of course, why I'm here today, um, with my doctoral degree where I explored solo female serial killers and partnered serial killers who commonly called team serial killers, but I refer to them as partnered because it gives more autonomy between the men and the women instead of ignoring the women in these roles, as we've historically found, and I will talk about that. Upon completion of my PhD, um, I took a job at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in Vienna, working on a global homicide report. And then as it had been some time since I had been in America and I missed my family, I moved back to America, um, took the job at Norwich <laughs> University, um, and um, started as a lecturer. I've been there now 12 years. I'm a tenured associate professor, as well as the associate director for the largest program on campus, um, which is the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. During that time, um, my research had focused exclusively on serial murder, um, but I started to become interested in mass murder, um, not um, the least because of all the, the school shootings that we have in America um, and the way that we usually look, and I refer to it as multicide, so the killing of two or more people, we tend to look at them very differently. And so I was curious if there were similarities with these types of offenders, which embarked um, my book contract with Rutledge, got a year extension, I'm diagnosed and treated with cancer, I'm fine now. Um, and then six months because of COVID, I do not recommend writing a book during a pandemic, um, although in some ways it kind of forced me to get it done um, as we were in lockdown. So if you look at the, the history of this, basically 15 years um, that I've been studying serial murder and then now um, mass murder as well. This is my book. Um, part one focuses on serial murder who are serial killers. Um, so looking at offending patterns, explanations, um, and then what happens after the murders end, followed by part two, mass murder. Who are these mass murderers? Are there explanations? What's the aftermath? Part three, directly comparing serial and mass murder um, with offending patterns and adjudications and outcomes. And then comparing mass shooters and lone actor terrorists who do um, fall under the umbrella of multicide, if we think again of um, the killing of multiple people, and then conclusions in future directions. Today, I'd like to focus on what happens after the murders end, um, specifically with serial murder, although um, I will talk a bit about mass murder and how they are similar and different. So this diagram again shows the intersections between serial murder, mass murder, and lone actor terrorism. And I've given you a few offenders um, as an example. Um, so Ted Bundy, notorious serial killer, 
um, but did have some incidents where he was um, killing multiple victims in one um, incident. Um, so that basically is is showing, you know, the traditional narrative of serial killers is that they kill one at a time over a period of time. Um, and my research is starting to explore again those similarities and differences between serial killers and mass murderers. Are there serial killers who are actually killing multiple victims in one incident over a period of time? So Bundy is kind of just on that edge. Of course, he is a notorious serial killer. I would not classify him as a mass murderer. Charles Whitman um, from the University of Texas, who um, one of the first identified mass murderers of his kind in America, went up a, church, a, a school um, tower and was a sniper, basically um, killed victims that way. Dylan Roof, um, who killed a bunch of victims um, in a church, was radicalized online. Um, and um, so that's where he's sort of in that bridge between mass murder and lone actor terrorism. Eric Rudolph, um, notoriously the Atlanta um, Olympic bomber. And then Ted Kaczynski, um, who's a bit of a unicorn in all of this. Um, had he been successful, he did attempt to bomb an airplane, would have bridged all three of these classifications. Um, but as such, um, depending on who you ask, because he did commit uh, murders over a period of time, which classically a serial murder expert would say, well, then he's part of my group, part of who I research. But then again, of course, he had an agenda um, against industrialism and so on. So it's important to ask, is it possible for offenders to be both multi-side offenders and serial and mass murderers? Is it possible for offenders to be both mass shooters and lone actor terrorists? And what we typically do in our research is mutually exclusive. We like neat categories, um, but my research has found um, there's definitely some overlap here. So serial murder typically includes a time frame, a minimum body count, and a pattern. Offenders who unlawfully commit at least two discreetly separate murders over a period of time, um, that's the definition um, from a previous article based on um, decades of research, including the FBI, who clearly um, signified two or more equals serial murder. And then from my book, um, I tightened up that definition a bit more intentional murders, right? So these are not um, accidental or mass murder. What I'd also like to point out um, is the way that we define serial and mass murder has the potential to exclude groups of offenders, and in this case, women. So for serial murder experts who insist it must be three or more or four or more, you're either losing 17% or 41% of these female offenders in serial murder definitions, which means that's an entire category of offenders that we're losing offending and adjudication patterns on, which would help us to better understand this phenomenon. It gets worse with mass murder in terms of excluding females from the traditional um, definition. So mass murderers target multiple victims at once, usually are apprehended or found at the scene, having committed suicide or instigating suicide by cop, are more likely to show depression, frustration, or psychopathic-like personalities, may have experienced some kind of great loss or rejection, are methodical in their planning, but don't conceal their crimes, and very often use firearms. So you can see the current prevailing definition of mass murder is that it must be four or more, um, in which case we then lose 39% of potential female offenders. The traditional definitions also exclude mass murder to public spaces, and we know women are more likely to commit mass murder in the home. Um, they may not have four or more victims to kill if they're targeting their family members. And so by broadening this definition, um, we're able to better compare serial and mass murder. And my research has shown, um, as I've indicated, victim number is not a statistically significant finding, indicating offending patterns do not differ among serial or mass murderers with higher victim, low counts, uh, victim counts. So this basically shows that mass murderers are five times more likely to use firearms than serial killers. 
and offenders who use firearms are 2.5 times more likely to commit suicide or be killed. Um, for example, Stephen Paddock, who perpetrated a mass shooting in Nevada in 2017, left no suicide note or manifesto and died from apparent, an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. So these are some ways in which serial murderers and mass murderers differ. Serial murderers are predatory. Um, they like hands-on methods, strangling, stabbing. Um, if you're a male or a partner team or traditionally women um, use poison or more recently um, medical drugs um, to kill their victims. Also, serial killers don't traditionally want to be caught. Whereas mass murderers will go into an incident um, most likely planning not to survive. So this is where the continued lack of unified definitions based on differing victim, victim counts for serial and mass murder limits empirical research and the ability to accurately report incidents and prevalence statistics. Setting a consistent victim count for acts of multicide enhances the sample size of possible victims and offenders as well as a greater likelihood of including a more diverse set of offenders. So basically, um, for those online, again, just to kind of read through, there's really no clear justification for setting definitions of mass murder at three, four, or higher, um, except that um, obviously it has implications for policy, um, for um, gun control measures. If you have a higher victim count, um, maybe perhaps it's, um, it would definitely be very different than if you have a much smaller victim count for mass murder. Um, and again, my previous research shows no st statistically significant differences in those offending or adjudication patterns with my sample set at a victim count of two or more. This is my sample, um, 1900 to present day, roughly present day, um, 2019, to make sure that everyone um, has either uh, gone through their trial, have been convicted and sentenced. Um, I do include offenders who committed suicide at the scene like mass murderers because it was clear that they were the perpetrator. It is an international sample. Um, so 994 serial offenders, um, 695 cases, mass murderers 645 um, or 605 cases. And I've highlighted in red um, the sample of serial and mass murderers shows, perhaps not surprisingly, that these crimes are more commonly committed by men. However, it is important to note that partnered serial mass murder is more common than partnered mass murder, indicating um, differences in the dynamics of these offenders. For example, serial murderers, again, don't seek to be captured, whereas mass murderers are more likely to commit suicide at the culmination of their attack. So it may be more difficult for these offenders to agree that they are not going to survive this attack, which is why there are far fewer uh, partnered mass murderers than partnered serial. For those of you who are curious, um, this is based on uh, current UN classifications, including Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, the Caribbean, Northern America, and Oceania. Um, historically, America has very high numbers of serial and mass murder compared to um, other countries and regions, as you can very clearly see um, by how this sample is divided. So what I'd like to focus the rest of my talk on um, is really what happens after a serial or a mass murderer is caught. And there's the prevailing assumption in the field that if you're committing multiple murder, and you're caught, you'll get the book thrown at you, you'll be thrown in prison for the rest of your life, or if you're in a country where they have capital punishment, um, odds are very good that you will be sentenced to death. But what my research has found is some um, fairly interesting findings when it comes to how we treat uh, men, and with it, men and women differently within the system. So as you can see here, um, solo male and solo female, mass murderers more likely to commit suicide, um, highlighted in red. Most male serial killers sentenced to death or executed, about 77%. 
while female serial killers were most likely to be sentenced to a number of years imprisonment, about 42%. The male partnered serial murderers were most likely to be sentenced to death and executed, about 58%, while female partnered serial murderers were more likely to receive a number of years imprisonment, about 61%. So what this is showing is despite all of these sample groups committing multiple murder, they are not all treated the same um, by the, the criminal justice system. Um, male mass murderers, 72%, those who survived um, to face adjudication, most likely to be sentenced to life imprisonment, while female mass murderers more likely to be sentenced to death or executed. Male partnered mass murderers, most likely to be sentenced to life imprisonment, 69%. Female partnered mass murderers, most likely to be sentenced to death and executed, 50%, or life imprisonment, also 50%. Next, I completed a logistic regression, um, and this is uh, published in the article um, on the slide, as you can see there, on the adjudication patterns of the serial murders, which showed, one, um, women in the United States are less likely to be sentenced to death than men. Offenders who commute or travel are more likely to be sentenced to death, possibly due to an, in an increased likelihood of a successful conviction in multiple jurisdictions. Offenders who kill in a shorter time frame are more likely to receive death sentences. And these offenders are more likely to be males and partnered serial killers. And offenders who killed after 1970 are less likely to be sentenced to death, likely due to the moratorium on capital punishment in 1970s in America and the decline of capital punishment there as well. These results support previous research on the treatment of female offenders in the criminal justice system suggesting a reluctance to sentence women to death and execution, even at the level of committing multiple murders. Again, victim number is not a significant finding, indicating adjudic adjudication patterns do not differ among serial or mass offenders um, with higher low victim counts. This is my current research, um, and I'd just like to acknowledge Hannah Mendez Rockwood. Um, Norwich has an excellent undergraduate research program, and I've been very fortunate to have been assisted by several apprentices over the years who have worked on my research. Um, anytime I decide to add a new variable to my data set, which as you remember is hundreds of cases over decades, and countries. Um, this is excellent research for an undergraduate to get practical research experience while also assisting me. The less dead is a term coined by Stephen Egger, where um, serial murders are likely to target those who are um, marginalized or vulnerable in society, traditionally prostitutes, runaways, um, vagrants, and so on. With Hannah, we went into my data set and recoded the victims, uh, modernizing it for today to include full LGBTQ+, so not just um, homosexual men um, from, again, the 1980s definition, um, as well as immigrants and others um, to, to look at uh, vulnerable victims today and to see um, how they were targeted. So we are currently planning um, to submit to um, criminology. Um, we're just kind of tidying up a case study and a couple of other things, but I want to point out um, this binary logistic regression is quite different from the one that I just showed you. Um, basically showing that women are roughly 3.5 times more likely to be sentenced to death or a life imprisonment um, when they are targeting the less dead. So women specifically being quite predatory in choosing who they are going to kill, acting like men. Um, so you know, we know um, the case of Eileen Wernos, notoriously, um, she was a prostitute who killed several men um, using a gun, has been over um, time in history classified as America's first female serial killer. Um, she is not. But because of the way that she kills, um, she has been designated um, thus. So what this research shows is very clearly, these are the women in my overall sample who are the ones 
being executed and sentenced to life imprisonment. And again, they are targeting the specifically quite vulnerable groups. And this is where the criminal justice system has stepped in and said, um, for these crimes, we will sentence you to death or life imprisonment. So in summary, these empirical analyses of serial and mass murders support previous research on offending and outcome or adjudication patterns, but also demonstrate how empirically based analyses can enhance our understanding of these offenders beyond descriptive statistics, frequencies or percentages or case studies. In other words, while tradition, traditional methods provide useful foundational information on samples of known offenders, inferential statistics can provide explanations for why these offenders differ and hypotheses can be tested and estimations can be made against serial murder populations, including offenders who are known and unknown. Descriptive and inferential statistics are important tools for researchers who seek to understand the complex phenomenon of multicide. Empirical analyses can also help us to better understand the effects of prosecutorial decision-making, particularly with respect to violent offenders who differ with respect to gender, socioeconomic status, and race and ethnicity. I'd like to end by talking about capital punishment, um, which we still have in America, um, although is um, currently waning. Research shows uh, 53, about 2% of women on death row um, compared to 98% of males. 16, only 1% have been executed since 1976 compared to 99% of males. Of the 19, 27% of female serial murders in this total sample who were sentenced to death, only 13, 11.9% were executed. And in comparison of the 141 um, or 41% of male serial murders sentenced to death, 23% were executed. 31% of the male partnered serial murders were sentenced to death and 17% were executed compared to 20% of death sentences for female partnered serial murderers with 13% executed. Female serial killers are also more likely to receive commuted sentences to be released, placed in a psychiatric facility or be granted immunity or parole compared to male serial killers. All of these findings are consistent with the literature on gender, the death penalty and the criminal justice system. For example, according to Stribe, Women account for about one in 10, 10% of criminal homicide arrests. Women account for only one in 50, 2% of death sentences imposed at the trial level. Women account for only one in 67, 1.5% of persons presently on death row. And women account for only one in 100 um, or 1% 1 of persons actually executed in the modern era. So the women who were executed um, in my sample were more likely to violate multiple norms with respect um, to respectability and what's known as appropriate femininity. Capital punishment opponents argue it disproportionately affects poor people and ethnic minorities. According to the Death Penalty Information Center in 2019, 57.8% of death row prisoners were people of color. And while white and African-American prisoners each make up 42% of those on death row, approximately 60.4% of the population is white. Another issue regarding ethnicity does not involve the offender, but rather the victim. In 82% of the studies reviewed, the race of the victim was found to influence the likelihood of being charged with capital murder or receiving the death penalty. That is, those who killed whites were more likely to be sentenced to death than those who killed blacks. So what comes next? Um, I'd like to continue exploring the intersections with multicide, including things like massacres. Um, so the Jonestown, um, as we know, there was um, at the airstrip, a mass murder incident um, where they, um, a number of uh, politicians um, and a camera crew were killed in addition to the giant massacre that happened. I'd also like to continue to focus on victims um, one of the major limitations with my research is that um, victims of multicide, serial and mass murder are commonly um, written up as a number. So in terms of getting quality detailed information, race, ethnicity, sex, 
um, socioeconomic status, relationship to the offender, means that my data set is quite smaller compared to some of the other larger data sets that you will see on serial and mass murder, because I will not include a case if I don't have that full spectrum of victim details. This is where with my article on the less dead, I'd also like to continue to research capital punishment um, and the effects of um, race um, and ethnicity on victor and offender dynamics, particularly with respect to prosecutorial decision-making I'm deciding whether or not to go forward um, with a life sentence or capital punishment um, in certain cases. Which um, again, further exploration, race and ethnicity dynamics, also continuing to explore the use of plea bargains, um, especially in these partnered cases. So the case that got me started with all of this research um, was Carla Hamolka and Paul Bernardo, um, two Canadians, killed three young women, one of whom was her sister. Carla secured a 12-year plea bargain in order to testify against her male partner. And then they found videotapes um, showing her participating um, in the rape and torture of the um, two other victims. And so he is in prison for life. She is currently free. And that was the case um, that really interested me in how women are treated by the criminal justice system, again, at the level of committing multiple murder. Um, and with these partnered cases, we're definitely seeing, you know, one person in the party may be viewed um, as less culpable, more likely to provide testimony against the other partner. Um, but what, what my research is basically showing again is that uh, men and women are treated quite differently, but that these dynamics within the relationship do shift. Um, and so it's important to understand um, the effects of gender with plea bargains, with convictions, with dispositions, adjudications of multi-side offenders, not just with respect to sex, but also race and ethnicity, social class, and co-offending. At some point, um, I would also like to get the offenders' narratives. And so actually speaking with or surveying um, these offenders who are currently in prison, I expect that will probably take um, the rest of my natural academic career um, with respect to all of the prison red tape. And um, I'm sure a lot of these um, offenders have been asked to report on their story, um, but that is where I would like to go next. And then I would just like to take a minute to thank um, everyone at Rutledge and where my book was published, especially my editor, and my friends and colleagues at Norwich University, including the faculty development program, and to all of my apprentices who have helped me in various ways um, with my data set, and then the American Association for University Women um, for their recognition and support of my research through an American fellowship a publication grant. Some references for those of you who are interested. And thank you. So I think we have a decent amount of time for questions. And I know there's a microphone we ask that you please use um, so that everyone can hear you. Hello there, and thank you for a very fascinating speech. Um, I don't know whether it's common amongst the people sitting here. You said that you'd like to speak to more offenders. Um, do you have any idea whether there is an overwhelming reason why people commit murder? Or are there are a variety of reasons? Is it revenge? Is it hatred? Do you have any idea? So, um... I would like to speak to the offenders, I think, because their narratives are currently what's lacking in the system. Um, before embarking on my book project, I did um, put um, an IRB proposal together, received permission, I think, from eight state boards of corrections in America to interview female serial killers, about 50. Um, and after two years, again, of red tape, um, interviewed one. So that was where I determined the book project um, perhaps would help um, enhance re my reputation, of course, and that um, I wasn't really looking to speak to these offenders about the crimes, 
but about their childhood, their adolescence, um, and kind of prior to the crime, which is perhaps less threatening for them because again, they're, they're likely harassed or asked repeatedly by journalists, especially every year there's um, you know, an, an anniversary, if you will, of the crimes or, or executions. I, when I was doing my doctoral research here at Cambridge, did like many researchers attempt to develop a typology. Um, and the best I could do was um, pleasure oriented versus purpose oriented. But even then there's a gray zone, there's overlap. And since then I have consciously moved away from motive, from trying to understand why these offenders do what they do and to look very carefully objectively at things that we can quantify, um, offending patterns, adjudication patterns being among those. I am not a trained psychologist or psychiatrist, so I would never be comfortable diagnosing someone or attributing motive. My hope is that my research will allow these practitioners to look at these objective variables and develop better classifications of these offenders. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I want to be a bit cheeky and ask for one clarification and two questions. Sure. So my clarification is I wanted to check in your arguments around the less dead, was what you were saying that is if a victim or multiple victims are less socially valuable, people who kill people that are less socially valuable get less severe penalties. And if people are more socially valuable, they get more severe penalties. So that was the clarification. And then the two questions I have relate to that. One is, have you looked at anything to do with the less dead and plea bargains? And the second question just goes back to right at the start when you were talking about your comparisons between serial murder, mass murder, and lone terrorist killers. I was fascinated at the potential comparisons between someone who might be classed as a lone terrorist killer and someone who could be a mass murderer. And it links a bit with what you were just saying about psychology and risk and the people who manage those things. What do you hope your findings might do? Because could it be that if you are treating someone as a lone terrorist killer and you're managing a risk for that kind of offense, but actually the offense could easily have been a mass murderer that that person might be managed differently. So what are your thoughts around what the results of your research could do? Thank you. Um, so to the first point, um, I think what my research is fairly clearly showing, um, and I can say this with some, um, some degree of um, weight behind the words is that when it comes to women who are killing less dead, the less dead, they are treated more harshly. The flip side of this potentially is that if you are a white male serial killer who is targeting um, African-American prostitutes, the prosecutor may make the decision based on that victim type that to go through the full trial process um, is a, perhaps um, may not result in what we call a slam dunk, right? So depending if you are a male serial killer who's killing young college age women, white women, that in apparently the American justice system would be a slam dunk you are going to be sentenced to death and executed based on all of our societal and historical norms. They, the less dead under Egger's definition are those who are marginalized, those who are um, prostitutes, runaways, they're less valued in society, yes. So what my research seems to be indicating is that women, who are targeting the less dead are viewed as exceedingly violent and um, not, not following the script of appropriate femininity, femininity, where women are meant to be nurturers, we're meant to be carers. And so as a woman, if you're targeting this particularly vulnerable group, that is exceptionally predatory 
and the criminal justice system will view you as excessively abnormal. But then again, the flip side of that is, well, what about the men then? So why are men who are targeting the less dead not viewed similarly as targeting vulnerable members of society? And I think this is where there's a double standard here. So I hope that answers that first question. Um, plea bargains are tricky. Um, this is where I would love if any of my Norwich colleagues, colleagues or students are listening um, to have someone delve into the, the literature and see what plea bargains are occurring in these cases. Um, that is a piece that's currently missing, but again, um, is a research project that I would love to further add to my project. Um, and then with respect to, so why I added, um, let's get through. There we go. Why I added this group of lone actor terrorism um, with respect to mass murder again. So this idea of multicide is the killing of two or more people. And so if you could imagine outside this graph, you know, there's terrorism, there's gangs, there's the mafia, there's other groups who are killing for very distinctly different, either political or ideological or profit-driven motives. But with lone actor terrorism, they aren't necessarily, they may identify with a particular group, but that group hasn't identified with them. It's the best way I can describe it. And so they may be acting under some of the um, ideology or the misogyny or the racism of particular groups, but haven't fully identified as being a member of the KKK or um, various terrorist organiz um, organizations. So in visualizing multicide in this sense, the idea again for my research is to explore not just the differences amongst these groups, but potential similarities as well. Um, and to your question, I think sometimes there is a tendency for criminal justice organizations or governmental organizations to view these spheres as completely separate and belonging to international organizations or domestic organizations or what have you. And there's not that communication amongst those groups that should be happening because again, if you focus only on the differences, then you can continue to have that argument, well, this is my territory. I don't need to talk to a domestic law enforcement agency because this is clearly international or vice versa. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to the point about the the kind of less dead groups and the the reason that women are um, sort of punished more is because they're kind of seen as less than uh, their uh, their femininity isn't isn't quite as intact. I wondered if that kind of correlation also held with other groups that were sort of more vulnerable, so children and the elderly and that kind of thing, rather than those marginalised parts of society. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, so I don't include children as the less dead because they are historically very protected members of society. Um, police are more likely um, to invest more resources if there's a murder of a child in a community versus um, someone of a different age group. It really is very unsettling when children are murdered. Um, so I do not include that group and nor did Egger initially. The elderly he does include, but primarily um, just male. No, is it? I think he primarily focused on male elderly and I've expanded it to include a male or female elderly. Um, as we know, those in care homes may be more likely to be forgotten, may have family who have um, kind of stopped caring for them or no longer um, are part of the family unit. And so those also would be classified as vulnerable or marginalized um, victims who are also um, more likely to be targeted by serial killers who are looking for victims that won't have family, friend, community looking for them if they die or go missing suspiciously. 
other questions? Anything online? Sorry, do, not yet. Okay, I'm up. Um, serial killers seem to be the main staple of TV crime drama. Um, when you look at those, if you see those, what tends to be the most frequent divergence with reality based on your research? Um, that's a great question. I've spent most of my career fighting against the sensationalistic nature of how serial murder is portrayed in TV and the movies. Um, by using higher level data like this, I am trying to make the point um, that you don't have to focus on just the popular case studies and frequencies and percentages. Um, I personally try not to watch TV and movies that focus on serial murder because then um, I go into work mode and start dissecting it and I can't and it should never be viewed as entertainment unfortunately that's how it is viewed anytime I see a white man on the TV that equals Ted Bundy so there's common tropes that are used throughout um, I do have 14 case studies in my book um, I do include Ted Bundy, but the point to including him was also to recognize the victims. So he was the first case study I started. Um, and in terms of trying to find the names of the victims took far longer than it should have. There is so much information on Ted Bundy, on Jeffrey Dahmer. There's a new, I think a Netflix um, film or miniseries on Jeffrey Dahmer. What I'm trying to fight against with my research is the sensationalizing of these offenders, of every time an anniversary comes around of when they were captured or when Ted Bundy was executed. We should not be doing a retrospective on their lives. Or if we insist on doing that in our society, that we at least do a better job acknowledging the victims. Um, and so with every case study, I include the names of the victims. I try to include quotes from family and friends so that it's not just this obsessive fixation on the offenders. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I couldn't help but notice a huge disparity between men and women committing these crimes um but then i wasn't surprised by it which is interesting in itself why is that <laughs> um so i mean historically and across decades and countries women are less likely to commit murder um, roughly 10 percent of women um, i think commit murder compared to i think it was eric hickey in his research who said um 17% of serial killers are women, which is quite interesting because if you're a woman and you commit murder, you're apparently more likely to commit serial murder than a one-off. Women who commit murder are more likely to target family, friends, patients, um, so in hospital settings, and are able to kill for a longer period of time because there is that resistance of society to view a woman as capable of any kind of violent crime, let alone murder. So if you have a healthcare worker on a unit and a bunch of patients are dying, it is very difficult for that hosp hospital to say, well, we have a serial killer in our midst versus, well, it's a hospital. Of course, people get sick and die. And I think this is where in trying to look at the outcomes, there are a lot of questions about, so then how do we treat these offenders if you're a male or a female or a partnered group and you've committed to killing multiple people? Clearly there are differences in the way that we treat them. And so my research argues we need to break down stereotypes and misconceptions about women. 
I'm not arguing that women need to be treated more harshly, just that the criminal justice system understand that there are um, excuses, excuses and rationales that women can use, domestic abuse, abuse, learned helplessness um, that perhaps a male offender can't use. But there's certainly more research to be done in that area of culpability. Um, and again, part, I'm, I'm mostly fascinated with the partnered serial killers and those dynamics, because for one person to kill a bunch of people over time, that's one thing. But to convince someone else or someone's else to do that with you is a very different dynamic. Um, and then as we see the criminal justice system, depending on age, depending on socioeconomic status, may view, may view one person in that party as more culpable. Where my argument is, you know, before you make that leap, really do look at the actions that both parties made in these decisions. You know, if one person didn't actually commit the murder, but helped to procure the victims, are they less or more culpable? And that should that be a consideration of the criminal justice system? Other questions? Um, do you think there is a way to reduce these disparities following on from the question within the justice system? Or do you think it's purely based on stereotypes? Um, I'm going to have to say yes, <laughs> because that's what my research is hoping to do. Um, I think it, I mean, I've, I was very fortunate um, when I did my master's thesis at, at Northeastern, I interviewed lawyers in Canada who were very generous with their time and their materials. And, you know, obviously because of um, client confidentiality, weren't able to give me um, specific details of that case, but could speak in generalities. And I followed that method with my doctoral study here at Cambridge um, and actually did field work um, here in England and then in three states in America. And I think lawyers do recognize that, you know, there is a tendency sometimes to rely on stereotypes, to take the easier path of, you know, wanting to wrap up a trial, so going with the plea bargain, um, with the seemingly less dangerous offender to put a bow on the case and to move on to the next thing. Um, but I think that there is a recognition that um, you know, when you have research like, like what I'm trying to portray, that maybe we should hit pause on some of these cases and think very carefully again about the autonomy of the offenders in these cases, the decisions that they made, and to not just, you know, speed it through the system in the interest of getting through to the next case. Um, but I do think, you know, we all have our own implicit biases. We all have our own um, stereotypes that we, you know, ascribe to. And I think it will take time and effort for the criminal justice system to take a look at these cases in particular. And, and obviously when you start it at an extreme end, Right. What I'm trying to say is with serial murder and mass murder, the most extreme violence that you can commit. Can we look at this smaller group and then apply what we've learned to other areas of the criminal justice system, to single homicides, to assaults, to how we view these offenders? Is there something that can be said in my research that lawyers, prosecutors, judges, juries can actually say, okay, you know, we, we need to look at this very carefully. And hopefully um, this research will inform the criminal justice system moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for answering the question so fully and so interestingly. Could you just um, a bit more clearly for me? You had um, a, a world uh, table, did you not? 
And I think at some point you you mentioned um, guns being used. Is there any relationship between the availability of guns in various parts of the world and the numbers of mass and serial murders? Um, sadly, yes. So again, serial killers are less likely to use guns, whether you're solo male, solo female, or partnered. Serial murders, um, if you're a male or partnered, more likely to have a hands-on method. Um, they want to touch the victim while um, murdering them, stabbing, strangling, and so on. So a few of serial killers more likely to use poison or medical drugs. Um, so a bit of a hands-off method. Mass murderers, um, and I think I have my arms. Um, mass murderers are more likely to use um, firearms. Oh, I had it. And you can see we're also um, plays into to this graph. Killers are less likely to use firearms. Mass murderers, because with a gun, you are likely to kill more victims. Um, you are more likely to see it with mass murder than than serial murder. We also know mass murder is more likely to commit suicide. And so either through instigation by cop um, or using the firearm, we know firearms it's more lethal, you're more likely to have a completed suicide. Um, so in my book, I also argue that, um, you know, considerate gun measures also speak to potentially preventing suicide in countries like America, where we do have a high prevalence of guns, easy access to guns. Um, there's some very good research on suicide um, that speaks to, you know, if you have an access to a gun, um, and you decide to commit suicide, you are far more likely to be successful than um, if you're in a country where you don't. And we also see um, you know, countries like China where they don't um, have mass weapons, uh, mass firearms weapons, um, relying on things like knives, still can be fatal, but with much smaller victim counts if someone decides to go on this kind of a, a killing um, spree to, to kill as many victims as possible. So to that argument um, with the graph, yes, I think part of the reason why, um, oops, did we go? Wrong way. Um, but America has, we do have a lot more access to guns, um, which also results in higher levels of victims um, and more cases as well, but more likely with mass murder than, than serial. I'm confident about people counts and, and how the definition works, whether or not that includes exclusively as an effect on on how you see that um so when i i did my doctoral degree i did limit partnered serial killers to at least one male and one female because i was particularly interested in how women were treated within that partnership um, in the criminal justice system i have since expanded as you can see to same sex partners or mixed sex partners. Um, and again, you know, quite tellingly, mass partnered far less common than serial partnered. Um, there is, you know, with the male female groups, usually an element um, of a, an intimate partnership between the offenders that then becomes unstable um, and these, you know, like solo male, they're operating in, under much smaller timeframes than solo females. Um, but usually there is a, a romantic element um, to those partnered offenders. I haven't specifically, um, again, because I um, am very cautious around motive, haven't necessarily explored 
um, the same sex partnerships and why they're coming together? Are they family members? Yes, in some cases they are. There's some mother son combinations um, that I have in the serial case or you know, brothers um, in the mass murder. Um, but that's a very interesting question and, and something that I should like to delve a bit more into of without getting into you know, the gray area of motive, but actually what these partnerships consist of and their relationship to each other. Thank you. About four more minutes, maybe time for one more question if anyone is interested otherwise. And I think I shall say thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate you coming um, to see my talk. Um, thank you to Cambridge as well for you know, supporting the initial stage of my research. And then as you can see, I have a lot of other work to do, but I'm very excited to embark on this next stage. Thank you very much. Thank you.